Hi, good morning. It's pretty bright, so I can't really see you guys, unfortunately. I would have liked to make some eye contact with all of you. But um, anyways, yeah, it's great to be here this morning. Um, I'm very privileged, and I'm actually very humbled um, to be here, to have been asked to come and speak today. Um, I'm a big fan of TED, of TEDx, of all the talks, so it's um, a big privilege for me to be here this morning. Um, so what I wanted to share with you guys a little bit this morning um, on adversity, overcoming adversity. Um, what I want to share with you is basically my life and what I've been through. Share from my heart simply and just to be really real and open with you guys and how I overcame the different situations in my life on the court, off the court, to be able to have done what I've done and achieved what I've achieved um, and be where I am today, basically. So um, tennis is, is really funny how I got into tennis. Um, I started when I was 10 years old. Before that, I actually wanted to be a pediatrician. I wasn't into sports at all. I uh, had a really good friend in school, and she was a great tennis player in juniors, and so I used to spend a lot of time with her on the weekends and after school. And one day it just so happened that I followed her after school. We were going to do our homework together, and she had a tennis lesson. So I went to the club, and I just waited for her. And I was watching, and all the kids were playing, and it just looked like so much fun. Not that I wanted to play tennis, but I just wanted to play this game that all the kids were playing. There's about 20 of them hitting the ball and running around the court. So someone saw me and said, would you like to play? And I said, yes, I would love to. Said, well, get your racket and go on the court. I said, well, I don't have a racket. So OK, well, go down to the pro shop and ask for a racket and go on the court. So I did that. And the lady said, well, what racket do you usually use? I said, well, I've never played. I don't know. She's like, oh, OK. So she gave me a racket. And she she showed me to another court where there was a pro and two little kids playing. And the pro was there and he was just about to hand toss the ball. He was showing them how to hold the racket. And I thought, well, that's not what I want to do. I just want to go over there and play that game. Anyways, I went on the court and I could see it like as if it was yesterday. Um, I was holding the racket. The coach hand tossed the ball to me and I can see the net plain as day. I swung, I hit the ball over the net into the court. And the coach looked at me and said, who told you to come on this court? I said, the lady in the pro shop. No, 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 wrong court. He sent me to a second court. And on the second court, after five minutes, the coach said to me, who told you to come here? I said, well, the coach over there. And he's like, no, no, wrong court. Go to this court. So third court, never ended up playing on the court with all the kids playing this great game around the world. Stayed on the third court for at least a half an hour, 45 minutes. And at the end of the practice, the kids were actually serving and playing points. I didn't know what to do. I was making sure I was the last one so I could try to copy exactly what they were doing. <laughs> and at the end, I got off the court, and the head pro comes to me. And he says, hi, I'm Kevin. I'm the head pro here. I've never seen you at my club. What's your name? How old are you? And where are you from? How long have you been playing? I said, well, I'm Rachel's friend. I'm Mary. I'm 10 years old. I'm from here. And I've been playing about 45 minutes. And he says, no, 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 but how many years have you been playing? I said, well, it's my first day. <laughs> he said, come back tomorrow with your parents. I said, OK. So I ran off to Rachel. I said, oh, I think I'm in trouble. I shouldn't have gone and played. I have to come back tomorrow with my parents. <laughs> So I don't know what was going to happen. So we come back the next day after school. My parents, Rachel, her parents, I'm standing on the side watching them all talk. And uh, after about 20 minutes, they come and say, OK, Mary, you're going to start to take lessons after school you know, three times a week for an hour. I said, OK. Um, I was a good girl, and I did what my parents told me to do. So I started to take lessons. And a few months after that, they said, well, you're going to start to play tournaments. And I was like, oh, I didn't really want to do that because then I had to start competing and playing my friends. And I didn't want to beat them because I felt really bad. Um, but I had to compete. So that was a bit tough for me. And after um, three years, I'm fast forwarding. Uh, at 13 years old, my father decided to take me out of school and um, to move to France. My mom is French from Paris. And he wanted me to play professional tennis already at 13, but I couldn't because the minimum age is 14. So we moved to France where we could get some help um, from the French Tennis Federation. Um, we didn't have a lot of money. We had very modest means growing up. Um, we traveled a lot in our car. We slept in our car sometimes. We lived a lot in hotels as well. Um, 
had a really extremely difficult childhood, um, went through a lot of pain, a lot of suffering, a lot of turmoil in our family as well. And moving to France and training there was also another step for me that was very difficult because I was leaving behind the little friends that I did have, going to a country where I couldn't even speak the language. So it was very difficult as a 13-year-old. I don't have any friends to play with. I can't speak to anyone. No one understands me. They don't, I don't understand them. So it was really, really difficult. And since I wasn't in school, I started training eight hours a day at least. So it was basically all day long and sometimes hours and hours without stopping, without sitting, without having a drink. It was really, 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 really tough. And so I turned 14 years old, started playing on the Pro Tour. I think I won my second ITF $10,000 tournament, um, quickly started doing really well. And by 16 years old, I was probably, I think, around top 30 in the world. I won my first kind of big tournament in Italy. And um, at the same time, there was a lot of things going on in my life, personally and in our family, and it was extremely, extremely difficult. And I couldn't wait to be 18 years old, because I thought, well, when I turn 18, I'm just out of there and I'm going to do whatever I want to do. So 18 years old comes around and I decide to leave and my parents get divorced and it was a really difficult time I think for everybody in my family. So as I left I went to stay with a friend and at that moment I said okay now I'm going to really do whatever I want to do. Um, what do I want to do? I'm going to keep playing tennis. Am I going to go back to school because I still don't have my high school diploma yet? Or am I just going to get a job? What do I want to do? What's going to make me happy? So I was in Bradenton actually staying with a friend. And three months go by and I'm just kind of doing whatever I feel like. Normal stuff. Vacuuming, grocery shopping, making my friend dinner, laying by the pool. Just whatever I felt like doing because I never really felt like I could do that. And after three months I thought to myself, no, I want to keep playing tennis. And at that point I was talking to my friend, well, what should I do? And she said, well, why don't you ask Nick if he wants to coach you? And I thought, really? Do you think he'll want to coach me? Because he's got all these great, top, amazing players that he's coaching. Would he have time for me? So I just called him and I said, Nick, I'm in town and I would love to know if you would coach me. And he, we had a really great conversation. He said, come Monday and let's have a practice session and we'll go from there. I said, okay. I was really nervous. <laughs> come Monday and we had a great practice session and Nick kind of became like a second father to me during that time in my life and someone that I really trusted, really felt that cared about me, had my best interests at heart and I continued to train really, really hard. And funny enough, like a year later, I uh, was in the final of my first Grand Slam tournament, um, the French Open. And a year after that, I won my first Grand Slam title in singles, the Australian Open. And even despite all of the great success that I was having and everything going amazing, I still had something inside of me that was missing. I felt unhappy, maybe I was doing the wrong thing, maybe I should have been a pediatrician all along, I don't know, something's missing. And I just continued, I continued, and I was really seeking and searching inside of me, spiritually as well, I had a lot of questions about my life and all the difficult things that I had been through. And as I continued to play tennis, I continued to be very, very successful. And. Um, there was a moment in my life where I just felt like I couldn't continue with how things were going. Um, despite all my success, despite the amazing life that I had and everything that anyone could imagine to dream, to do, or to have, I was doing and I had. But there was still an emptiness and something missing inside of me. And um, I became a born-again Christian in March of 2000. And from that moment, my life completely changed. And that was the moment that I was able to, one, see and realize that God had really given me a gift to be able to play tennis, that that was his plan for my life, and that I was able to forgive my father, my family, everything that had happened, all the pain, all the hurts, everything that I had gone through, I was able to forgive and to let go and to move on in my life. And I think, um, I just have a little clip I want to show uh, adversity. Adversity. I was looking up. When we say I've been through a lot of adversity in my life, what does that mean? 
And I looked up this definition. It says difficulties, misfortune, and synonyms I thought was really interesting. Hardship, distress, suffering, affliction, sorrow, misery, pain, trauma, accident, upset, setback, tragedy, hard times, trials. When I look at that list, I think, man, every single one of those I've experienced and I've been through. And how did I come through that? There, there's an interesting story um, that I want to share with you guys. I was, I won the French Open. That was my dream in tennis. I achieved that in the year of 2000. Not only the singles, but the doubles as well. I played with Martina Hingis. And I always thought whenever I won the French Open, that was it. I'm going to retire because that was just my dream. I didn't need to play tennis anymore. I had done everything I needed to do. But the funny thing was when I won the French Open, I was so much more motivated to work even harder and to keep going because I thought, man, I'm, I'm not even, I haven't even reached my full potential yet. I want to work even harder. I want to be even better. I want to win more titles. So I was so much more motivated to just keep going and keep going and work harder. And the funny thing was I didn't know it was waiting for me the following year. The following year, 2001, I was playing in Strasbourg the week before the French Open, going to defend my title, and I was having a lot of back pain. and. I started having trouble running, and I couldn't even run for a ball or run for a drop shot, and I thought, something's not right. You know, I thought, well, my back is stiff in the morning. I'll just loosen it up, I'll be tough, it'll be okay. But when I couldn't run for a ball, I thought, something's wrong. So I went to see the doctor, had the MRI, and had everything checked, and that's when he told me that I had a herniated disc and a bulging disc in my lower spine. And basically, I had to stop and rest and wait for it to heal. So that was a big shock to me because the week right after that was the French Open and I would need it to defend my title. So I went home and I rested and I said, well, how long is that going to take? And they said, well, I don't know. We'll just take it week by week and we'll see. <laughs> week by week turned into seven months. And I was in so much pain, standing, sitting, laying down. There was no position that was comfortable. And the only thing I was allowed to do was walk my dog in the morning 10 minutes and at night 10 minutes. And thank God I had a long-haired chihuahua that weighed five or six pounds. <laughs> Otherwise, I don't think I would have been able to walk a bigger dog. <laughs> so after seven months, I started rehabilitation for my back. I was so excited to finally do something and move. So I went the first day, and the physical therapist said, OK, five minutes on the bike. I did five minutes on the bike. I go, OK, what's next? And he said, go home. I said, what? <laughs> That's it? Yes, back. You've got to go slow. Go home. We'll see you tomorrow. I thought, oh, this is just going to take forever. Slowly but surely, then I start to be able to get back on the court and start hitting. Two weeks into hitting, my back starts hurting again. And then I have to go back to the doctor. And I said, well, what am I going to do? And he says, you know what? I don't know if you're ever going to really be able to play tennis again competitively at the level that you played. That moment, I don't know how I responded. I don't know if I broke down crying at that moment or later when I got home, but that was a big shock to me because I thought, I'm 26 years old, I'm just at the top of my career, and I might not be able to ever play again. That's not possible. <laughs> so I had to go back home, rest, until there was no more pain, start the whole process over again. And I was able to continue. And I was able to play. I had pain, I had days that were better, I had days that were worse. And the funny thing was that through all of that, from being top five in the world, I went to almost 300 in the world. I had lost all of my strength, all of my speed, all of my fitness, all of my muscle, everything was gone. I had to start all over from zero, basically. And it took about until 2004 when I really finally felt that I was at 100% where I could start training hard again. So imagine 2002, 2003, trying to get back, trying to get back, not really having any results. And then 2004, finally feeling at 100%, now really I can train hard and I can go for it. And I'm training hard and I'm competing and I'm playing tournaments and I'm not having any results, nothing. And I get to the French Open, 2005. I'm in the gym at the training center at Roland Garros the week before the French Open. And I'm working out. And a French gentleman comes in. I don't know if he was a coach or if he worked for the French Tennis Federation. And he says, oh, hi, Mary. 
And I said, oh, hi. I didn't know who he was to recognize me. I just said hi back. And he says, what are you doing here? I thought, well, I'm working out. And he starts to laugh. And he walks into the gym. And he comes over to me I'm on, on the machine laying down. And he says, why are you working out? I said, well, because I'm here to prepare for the French Open. And he just burst out laughing. And I, he was laughing at me. And at that point, I, I knew that a lot of people were talking. They were saying, you know, Mary's done. She's already won the French Open. She's 30 years old now. She's completely out of shape. She hasn't had results for three years. Why is she still playing? She should stop, you know? But I knew in my heart that I wasn't done. And that's why I want to say that it's never over till it's over. And to believe in your dreams and in your heart when you know something is true. I knew in my heart that I wasn't done. I knew that there were still great things to achieve. I didn't know what, I didn't know when, I didn't know how, I didn't know where, but I knew that I wasn't done. And I knew that there was still something great left in me to achieve. And so no matter what anyone said or what people were saying or what they did, that wasn't gonna change what I knew it was the truth in my heart. And so, that gentleman left and he patted me on the back and he said, oh, okay, well maybe one or two rounds, you know, and he walked out of the gym and I kind of thought, that's okay, he has the right to think what he wants to think and say what he wants to say, but I know in my heart what is the truth. And we'll see who's laughing last. So how did I do <laughs> the 2005 French Open? Okay. I didn't win, <laughs> but it's not bad. I made the finals <laughs> against Justine Huna, who had an amazing tournament. And let me tell you, I am so proud of this picture because this actually, I can't say it means more than my French Open title, but it means almost just as much because of everything that I had been through, all of the pain, all of the hardships, all of the struggles, all of the setbacks, everything that I had been through, every single victory, every single match that I won meant so much more. They were so much sweeter than any other match that I won just because of all the difficulties that I had been through. I persevered. I never gave up. I knew that there was still something left inside of me. Despite not having any results for a whole year and working hard, I never gave up. And I kept on fighting and I kept on believing what I knew what was true in my heart. So that's what I want to leave with you guys today. To have a dream, to never, ever, ever let go of that. Believe in that dream until the end and work hard and do whatever it takes to achieve that dream because it's never over till it's over. Thank you. Love you guys.